Sa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Olahudi Samya San Putoshe. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. It is Sunday, December 5th, here in Queensland, the 4th in California. We're about to launch into a special edition of our uh, investigation of the Flower Adornment Sutra's 10 Stages chapter. Uh, before we do so, we are here in Australia, and we have a new custom for new for the Sutra Lecture Series, which is called Acknowledgement to Country. And let me say it, that the Kumbumari people of the Ugambe language group practice their spiritual connections to land and to all creation in this location for thousands of years. Today, we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians. With gratitude, we share this land today with sorrow for the costs of that sharing, and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders past, present, and emerging. Yes. When I'm back in the Bay Area, uh, in Berkeley, it's the Ohlone tribe. Um, over on the, interestingly, over in the farthest reach of San Francisco, the western edge of San Francisco, right where the Golden Gate Bridge connects San Francisco County and Marin County, uh, the Muekwa Ohlone tribe is there. And what's interesting was they actually don't exist by the federal registry of tribes. They somehow fell through the cracks and yet their people, their ancestors, their current uh, residents have been there for as long as people have ever been on the planet. And yet uh, the Muekwa Ohlone got no, uh, no recognition and none of the, the benefits that come from that, from being on the official register. So uh, the Interface Center at the Presidio under the leadership of Paul and Jan Chafee and our board of directors, uh, re-campaigned uh, for the uh, visibility and the viability and the, the that the, the white folks get humble and say, 
it is not for us to recognize you. It should be the other way around. You were here first, we came later. Uh, we did some un unspeakable, horrible things to the, the original residents of uh, North America, Turtle Island. And so uh, the, through that, that work, the Ohlone tribe across the bay from the bay or from Oakland, from the East Bay, are gradually uh, reaching to the status that they should have had from the start. So how interesting, right? How looking back at history, uh, we, and by acknowledging, just simply saying the truth, the facts, that uh, we are uh, actually all immigrants if we are not members of the indigenous First Nations. So everybody else came later. Okay, now let's begin our sutra lecture today with our invocation of spirit. Here it is. Today we have the privilege of the accompaniment of a hundred year old veteran banjo. Here's our text today. We are going to repeat a little bit. Well, I say it's a special version, special edition of, of our series because we're going to zero in on one aspect of the, the Bodhisattva's first stage that needs more exploration. We're going to listen to it and then figure out uh, how it connects to, to us today. And it's an aspect of giving. We talked last week about giving as in the general uh, flow of Buddhist practices, how important it is. We talk about three kinds of gifts, gifts of material things, wealth, and the gift of courage, fearlessness, and then the gift of Dharma. And the, uh, the gift of material, when we're back at that, first, uh, more uh, regular, more ordinary form of giving. The Dharma further divides it up into giving of inner wealth and also outer wealth. And outer wealth is things outside. Inner wealth is the body itself. So let's take a look. Here we are. Here it is. We'll repeat. We uh, read this last week. We'll look at it one more time. Chou fo da zhi, xiu xing da she, fan shi suo you yi qie neng shi, so wei cai gu cang ku, jin yin mo ni, 
、珍珠、琉璃、科贝、碧玉、珊瑚等物，珍宝、璎珞、延伸之具，象、马、车、圣，努币、人民，诚意、聚落、园林、财冠，一切男女、内外、眷属。其余所有珍玩之具、头目、手足、血肉骨髓、一切身份，皆无所习。唯求所至广大智慧，施命菩萨注意出地，大舍成就。Ready? Okay, listening for the language and for the flow of the ideas. Because he, she, you can use a different pronoun if you prefer. Because he seeks the Buddha's great wisdom, he cultivates great renunciation. He is able to give away all things whatsoever. That includes such objects as wealth and granaries, gold, silver, money, pearls, lapis lazuli, shells, jade and coral, jeweled ornamental articles to decorate the body, elephants, horses, chariots and conveyances, servants and citizens, cities, towns and villages, parks. Groves, pavilions with vistas, wives, concubines, sons, daughters, followers near and far, and all rare curios whatsoever. He can give up his head, eyes, hands, and feet, his blood, flesh, marrow, and all parts of his body, begrudging none of them in order to seek the Buddha's great wisdom. This is called accomplishing great renunciation by a bodhisattva who dwells upon the first stage. So, what did we learn here?、Uh, this is giving, and the key is to seek the Dharma. The Bodhisattva values no nothing on earth but acquiring wisdom and knowledge of the Dharma, the ability to use it. So then it lists all those things, and clearly,、uh, the the valuable stuff, the coral and the jade and the the Uh, armies, <laughs> the palaces, and pavilions with vistas and things. And I don't own any. Well, I do. I do have a.、Uh, I I live in a place that's got a balcony, and because it's on a hillside, it's up in the air because the house, you know, the hill slopes down, and we're built at a certain level, so I can see out about twenty feet. That's why it's a good place for birds to land. But、uh, in terms of the other amazing items listed here. Clearly, it belongs to somebody with means. Maybe a king, maybe an emperor, maybe a corrupt public servant, right? A uh, uh, prime minister with deep sleeves and pockets, something like that. Maybe it's just a wealthy person who earned it all、uh, righteously. Somebody who's got a lot of material wealth can have those things and then give them away. Okay. So, Buddha Dharma also has the story of the widow's might. You know this wonderful story about how Jesus、uh, valued the little bit given by the poor person over the quantity of stuff given by a rich person, because, relatively speaking. The sincerity of the person who had little but gave it all was more than the rich person who gave a little. So, Buddhism also tells that story. Story is of a wealthy man who comes to the temple and unloads、uh, wagons full of oil for lamps, and the lamps themselves, and the wicks, and the tables to put the lamps on. And so the Buddha doesn't come out to greet. The、uh, the wealthy donor, the wealthy donor has to do his own bow, and the uh, the uh, in fact, as the story goes, one of the Buddha's disciples comes to the Buddha and says, "Venerable sir, the、uh, the wealthy、uh, the, the the wealthy nobleman is here," and the Buddha said, "Yes, I'm aware," and continues his eating, and then、uh, an old lady shuffles in to the monastery. And she takes out a little bottle, and she adds a bit of oil to the lamp, to the quantity of oil in the in the big basin. The way、uh, people who haven't been to 
uh, Buddhist temples in Penang, for example. Um, the uh, the Jushilin in Penang, the layman's lodge, was old fashioned. And the altar in front of the Buddha had uh, was a table. And then there was uh, a thin metal shelf built over the table, covering all of it. Uh, it was hard, probably, uh, it wasn't stainless steel, but it was some kind of steel and clearly inflammable. Why? And also easy to clean because on top of the table, on top of this steel covering was a bowl full of oil. And it was, you know, a salad bowl for a banquet that, that big around. And it was full of oil, inches, inches of oil like this from all the people who'd come up, poured the oil in. And floating in the top of the oil were these cork floats with a little wick about this long. And the wick went down in through the cor the round cork. Think of a Hong Kong dollar coin like that, big coin, about that big around and with a hole in it. So it floats and it also will carry a wick down. And then the wick stands up this high above the cork float. And you light it and then launch it out into the bowl of oil where it floats around with other, other lamp. That's your lamp. So it is a community lamp. Sam, have you seen the Penang? You know, yeah. And so there is maybe a dozen of these little cork floats with a nice little flame on top, all coming out of the same bowl of oil. So if you want to make an offering, you just take your bottle of oil and pour it into the lamp and it raises the level like that. The problem is, <laughs> uh, kids, don't try this at home. Please don't say, oh, the Dharma master told us we should make a lamp. Why? Easy to catch fire. That's why the metal, the metal top of the table kept, uh, it was harder to burn when burning oil came up. Uh, of course, you needed a wick, but still. And the other thing was, these little floating lamps give off uh, oxidized, vaporized oil into the air. So the whole table is oily to the touch. So if you, <laughs> our monastery in Berkeley is mostly made of wood and mm, you don't want uh, lighted lamps, flames full on top of a bowl of oil in, in, your, in your altar. So we, we did, that's one traditional Buddhist offering that we decided to not adopt. Anyway, so, Back to the story. The elderly laywoman comes in with her little bottle and she pours it slowly, reaches up and pours it into the, the bowl of lamp oil. And the Buddha sets aside his bowl, comes out and greets her and asks after her well being and her grandchildren and sees her back to the door. And the, the, the Buddha's disciples are like, ah, my gosh, look, uh, Shurfu honored this old lady, and yet he ignored the wealthy man. And so they ask him why, and he says, comparatively speaking, her offering was more meritorious because of her sincerity. That was all the money she had. She used it to buy a little bit of lamp oil and dedicate the merit to her family and to all beings. So I wanted to acknowledge the sincerity of her. So that's, there we go. Similar to stories you will have heard uh, from the Bible. So that's the giving of external wealth. But here, notice you may have blinked or maybe you ignored it or didn't pay attention to the Bodhisattva giving up his head, his eyes, his hands and feet, his blood, his flesh, his marrow, and all parts of his body. Did you, uh, hmm? what was that about? Yeah, so let's get something straight here. That's why I wanted to take a minute and discuss this because when my mother found out that I was going to become a Buddhist monk, One of the first things she said to me was, you're not going to burn your body, are you? And why would she ask a question like that? 
it's because of a, an incident that happened in Vietnam in 1963 when an elder Buddhist monk named Thich Quang Duc did burn his body on the crossroads in an intersection in Saigon. Uh, it was in Hue, city of Hue. And he did so for political reasons. The prime minister, Ziem, or maybe it was the president of Vietnam at the time was a Catholic, but the wrong kind of Catholic. And he was oppressing anybody who was not a Catholic. And of course that includes lots of Vietnamese Buddhists. And so it, the situation got so oppressive that a senior monk, Thich Quang Duc, uh, stopped a car, got out his two disciples, poured gasoline over his body, and the monk immediately pulled out a book of matches and lit them and just flared up into flame and sat still while the flames were burning. And one uh, AP photographer, a man named Brown, happened to be there because he had been told in advance that something was going to happen. And he was the only photographer there. And in the time that the uh, monk was burning, he shot off 10 rolls of film. And because the government knew how uh, incendiary, no pun intended, uh, this incident would become, they tried to grab the film, but uh, photographer Brown was savvy and expert, knowledgeable. So they uh, snuck the, uh, the film, 10 rolls of film on a passenger leaving on the next airplane to Manila. And Manila had uh, Philippines had the means to transmit the photos to New York. And the photos were, uh, went worldwide of a, uh, they're one of the most shocking photographs anyone has ever seen because there's a taboo about burning, especially when the person is voluntary and sitting upright. It was a photo seen around the world. Uh, people will remember probably uh, having seen that photo of Thich Quang Duc, this, this monk. Master Hua uh, told us not to try it. <laughs> he said, you Americans will try anything. He said, don't try it. The, the venerable monk who did this had samadhi and didn't move. He, he was clearly in an extraordinary state. And so, my mother saw this and assumed that this was something all Buddhist monks did. <laughs> and she had no idea, she didn't know. And she had seen that photo and it was shocking. Uh, New York Times would not run the photos. They said, this is over the edge too much. And yet uh, Time Magazine, Life Magazine, they all ran the photos. So um, what about this? What about it? Why, you know, hmm. Um, in the Lotus Sutra, there is a bodhisattva who is his medicine superior, I believe, who uh, offers, he lights his body on fire as an offering to the Buddha. And uh, they say his body is still burning as the story goes in the Lotus Sutra. So um, there is a scriptural <clears throat> reference for this, but uh, it, we need, that's why I wanted to make it clear. Here's our bodhisattva on the first stage, offering up all, even the things that we cling to the most dearly, which is our physical bodies, of course. We don't like pain. We prefer pleasure. The absence of pleasure is okay as long as there's no pain. Uh, if you don't believe, go walk down the aisles of your local here in Australia, we call them chemists. In America, we call them drugstores. And you will see shelf upon shelf of pain reliever, pain relieving medicine. 
um, our crisis of opioid addiction has to do with certain uh, drugs being serious analgesic. They quell pain. You can addict, you can get addicted to them because the feeling is so good on the other side of no pain. Um, so we don't do pain. We look for pain relief. Um, so here is a, bhikshu, a bodhisattva in training, the first stage. He's at the very beginning of his bodhisattva training. And yet it says, if he can get the Dharma, if he can learn how to fulfill his vows, which are in the center of his heart, her heart, the first stage is about vows. I want this to happen. I will do these things. And because of that, uh, anything else that I would ordinarily cling to and love, like my body, I can let it go. This is called the great renunciation of the bodhisattva. Dasha, uh, it's called. So how does it work? What, what's going on here? Um, I remember being in Los Angeles uh, at Go Huyo, along with uh, my Dharma brother at the time, Bhikshu Hong Kong, and uh, is uh, Richard now. And uh, Dharma Master Kong was already a monk when I first showed up at Gold Mountain. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that I first met at coming into the monastery, I met through uh, Hong Kong. He introduced me to the Great Compassion Mantra, for example. And, and uh, uh, Bhikshu Hong Kong was uh, uh, strong. He, he had a lot, of, a lot of samadhi and a lot of experience in various, sometimes extreme forms of practice. He, he could sit for hours and hours. Like that. So anyway, I remember uh, Hong Kong was there in visiting in LA with Master Hua while uh, Bhikshu Hung Chao, Marty and I were on, were on staff at Go Wheel down in LA. And the story about uh, the, the monk in the Lotus Sutra, whose, whose body is on fire, came up. And uh, Hong Kong said to Shifu, he said, uh, Shifu, I would like to try burning off a finger. Is that OK? He had heard about Master Empty Cloud, who had offered up a finger this one, I believe, or maybe it was this one, to the Buddha on behalf of his mother who had died in childbirth. And it was a custom at King Ashoka Temple, Ayu Wangsu in Ningbo, China, that that was a place where if you made an offering of parts of your body there, there was a lot of merit, was how the, the tradition went. That was where Master Xu Yun, Master Empty Cloud, burned off a finger. Well, of course, Hong Kong and I and the other monks there were like, wow, you know, that sounds like really, uh, you know, a lot of merit. Can we do that? And we and Hong Kong and I and the rest of us, we we're innocent. We don't know. We're, we were hearing about this for the first time. And Master Hua, sitting on the, the Dharma seat, shook his head and said, one thing about Americans. He said, you're willing to try anything. He said, he said, no, no, you may not carelessly burn off part of your body. You know, now that was a strong answer. And, and uh, Richard Hong Kong was asking for all of us. You know, he didn't know, I didn't know. And it was like, if Shurfu had said, sure, why not? We, who knows who would have tried it? We had already had burn scars in our heads. You know? So I, I don't want to uh, land on Hong Kong for asking because it was the question we all ask. And, uh, but he said it. He said, Shifu, can I want to burn off a finger like that, Mr. Empty Cloud? Shifu said, no, you cannot do that. He said, you guys are too green. You're wet behind the ears, if you know what that means. You're beginners. You don't have any experience. He said, this is not a game. And he referred to Tik Kwang Duk. He said, for that monk to be able to sit there while his body is burning, 
indicates that he had real accomplishment in his meditation. Now, in fact, one of Master Hua's disciples, uh, Guo Hangzhou, uh, was it, or Guo Zhu, in Manchuria, had done the same thing. Years, years before Shifu came to Hong Kong, before he came to the US, he had a disciple who had self-immolated and remarkable, remarkable story. This is, uh, I won't tell, I don't know all the details and I wanna get them right before I tell it, but this uh, Bhikshu disciple had been, had been through uh, uh, torture at the hands of invading troops. He had been through uh, starvation and famine. He had truly lived a hard life. And when he got to the Dharma, he, he, his attitude was he had nothing to lose. And so he threw himself into his cultivation and very quickly uh, attained states of samadhi. And so he wanted to offer his body to the Buddhas as an offering. And Shrifu told him not to, but he went ahead and did it. And the local magistrate, the local police chief came out when the word happened that, that uh, Master Hua's monk disciple had burned his body. And the vivid detail I remember in hearing this story the first time was the, the uh, police chief, the magistrate, came up to the hill where the hut was, where the, the monk had burned his body and he was, the monk was still sitting there. And the police chief came up and touched him and his whole body melted into ash like that fell. So it was burned through. He didn't move, he was sitting still. So you think here is somebody who has control over their own birth and death. That Shifu in explaining this said he had already left his body voluntarily. He was, they say, Lai Ming Chu Lai. He was completely clear on his birth and death. So for him to burn his body, there was no pain involved because the thing inside that would feel the pain and, and had already gone. So back to our story in Los Angeles, Master Hua says, you, you kids are, I appreciate your willingness to experiment, but I'm going to tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, you have to have real samadhi when you light your body on fire. He said, you don't do this carelessly. He said, you know what happens? He said, as soon as that pain hits your body and you shout and scream and say, quick, put this out. Why did I, damn, he said, he said, instead of having merit, you're gonna have offenses for slandering the Dharma. Don't kid around, this is not child's play, he said. So Hong Kong and the rest of us were like, we don't know, you know, this, we really want to make an offering to the Buddha. So Sherpa says, here's what I suggest. He said, instead, why don't you simply have less greed? He said, you know what Samantabhadra Bodhisattva says? Samantabhadra says that of all the giving you can do, the giving of Dharma is the highest. You don't have to do something extreme like burning your body just have less anger. Really use patience and transform your anger. You know, give up a little bit of the food that you crave at lunch so that there's more left behind for others. That's a real offering, gift of renunciation of things you love. He said, why don't you give up a little bit of your confusion and your pride? You Americans want to be number one in everything. Give up a little bit of that, and the Buddha will really love that. That's an offering that goes a long way. Don't burn your body. He <laughs> said, sure. I remember that because it was like. So we, you know, we didn't know what real cultivation is. We hadn't made the Bodhi resolve. We wanted something flashy and eye-catching that would get quick results, like a flame. Head trip. So, yeah, so that was, that was memorable. And so when you see, you know, here's our Bodhisattva on the first stage, who says he can give up every part of his body if necessary. That doesn't mean, and it needs to be said over and over again, 
That doesn't mean you go out looking for a chance to, you know, cut off a finger, give, give your eyes away, give a liver transplant. If you can, if you want to be a kidney donor, that's noble. That's selfless. If you're going to save someone's life by donating one of your kidneys, my goodness, I have my California driver's license has a little green dot on it, which says that I am uh, a, an organ donor. You can use the corneas of my eyes. You know, if I die in an accident, my eyes are still viable. Uh, they can use parts of my body as for transplants. Okay, there, that's a good way to do it. Uh, the Bodhisattva, in the way the Sutra tells it, is, he says, if, if there's an opportunity for me to let go of something that I care about a lot, my body, my health, in order to uh, hear the Dharma, mm, I will do so. Okay, so now that's, notice the way I said that. If the opportunity arises to uh, let go of physical comfort so that you can hear the Dharma, Bodhisattva is right there in line. There are monastics who are saying things like what? Oh, I'm not going to get vaccinated against COVID because Guan Yin Bodhisattva will save me. <laughs> Red X, wrong wrong. That's not giving up your body for the sake of the Dharma. That's putting an extra tax on Guanyin Bodhisattva, giving her more work than necessary. If you really want to give up that way, give up your pride and go get vaccinated. Give up the sense that you are somehow special and are not involved in transmitting uh, this deadly virus to other people through your set of lungs. Yeah, just swallow all that self-importance that you feel and get vaccinated. Give that gift to Guanyin Bodhisattva. Take your account off of Guanyin Bodhisattva's worksheet, right? And just do what science wants to do, which is save your life. Then go cultivate the way. Don't confuse selfishness with cultivation. So head trip, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, what does the, look, when we get to, this is, I, I wanted to point to this because uh, when we say giving up, you know, your body, your eyes, et cetera, your, your health for the Dharma, that really needs clarification. It's not careless, it's not casual, uh, it's not a whim, this is uh, precise. So where would we go to find out how the Abhatamsaka Sutra talks about giving up your body? Well, we can go to another chapter called the 10 Practices. I've got it right here. I wanted to bring this up. We explained the 10 Practices chapter years and years and years ago at Berkeley. And uh, I've got a, uh, here's the, can I do this first for my hardworking translator team so that uh, save them the work. Let me read it quickly. Now, this is in support of the 10 stages for stage, but it's the first practice out of the 10 practices, but it talks directly to the moment. Listen to how the Abhatamsaka Sutra tells us the way a bodhisattva values the Dharma over their own well-being. Fonzi I love Okay, you all saw the pattern of 10 
fundamental Buddhist practices there. Here's the story. We ready? Here's the story. What happens? Yao Kun 一世众生先来祈求菩萨见之福佩覆欢喜令我未来与一切世界一切众生中受广大声 Yan 坐着享受着享当官法界众生界无边无边之法空法无所有法无相法无体法无出法无一法无作法 so we're going to slide down. This is the Bodhisattva's practice of happiness. Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva is a great benefactor. He or she can graciously give away all things without with an equanimous mind, free of stinginess and regret. Doesn't respect a reward, doesn't seek name or fame, isn't greedy for material benefits, but gives only to save, protect beings, to take them across into his care and to benefit them. Then there's a long section that says, he gives to emulate the practices of all Buddhas, recollect, delight in, purify, further develop, uphold, reveal, proclaim the past practices of all Buddhas and cause them all to leave suffering and attain bliss. Disciples of the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva Mahasattva does this practice, he brings happiness and joy to all beings. Here we go, ready? Here's the deal. Wherever there's poverty, he uses the power of his vows to be reborn there as a wealthy, noble person possessing inexhaustible riches and treasures. So the Bodhisattva, on purpose, goes to rebirth as a wealthy person. Suppose, in thought after thought, there are limitless, numberless living beings who come to the Bodhisattva and say, humane one, we're poor. We have no sustenance. We're starving. We're emaciated. We're in dire straits. We are close to death. We only wish you would give us the flesh of your body to eat so we could continue to live. At that time, the Bodhisattva promptly gives it to them, making them happy and satisfied. 
Even though measureless hundreds of thousands of living beings come to beg from him in this way, the Bodhisattva never once retreats in fear, but only increases in kindness and compassion. Because of this living, because of this, living beings all come to beg from him. And when the Bodhisattva sees them, he becomes even more joyful. He thinks, I'm obtaining a great opportunity. These living beings are a field of blessings. They're my good friends without being asked. They're coming to teach me how to enter the Buddha Dharma. I should now cultivate and study in this way and not oppose the wishes of all these living beings. Okay, key, key to it. He further reflects, I vow that all the roots I have planted, am now planting and will plant, shall bring me to obtain an immense body so that I can use its flesh to fill and satisfy all the starving living beings in all worlds. If there's even a single living being who hasn't eaten his fill, I vow not to give up my life. The flesh I cut off, this body will also be inexhaustible. And with these roots of goodness, I vow to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and realize Maha Nirvana. I vow that all beings who eat my flesh will also attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, attain impartial wisdom, perfect all Buddha dharmas, and extensively do the Buddha's deeds up to and including entering Nirvana without remainder. If there's a single living being whose heart is not satisfied, I will not realize Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Okay, that's a long passage, but you get the point here. Look at this. This is how the Avatamsaka Bodhisattva, how the Avatamsaka Sutra describes the Bodhisattva willingness to give up what's called inner wealth. This is the giving of inner wealth to an extreme degree. Now, one thing to say about this is the Avatamsaka is an outrageous book. You think this is a sacred scripture. Well, here's a sacred scripture that's preaching cannibalism, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, isn't that cannibalism? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. So, but it's taking it to a place where we can be really clear about what an actual bodhisattva values, where the priorities are. In this case, the priorities are helping living beings. But notice, this is not simple. The Bodhisattva says, oh, here come all these hungry beings. They are asking me for something that ordinarily I wouldn't want to give up, my body, the flesh, the meat on my bones, as such as they are. And I can. I can give it to them because they need it and they ask for it. I am free of stinginess and regret. Furthermore, the Bodhisattva gives purely. What kind of pure giving? No rewards, not seeking fame as a real benefactor. I'm not looking for a benefit for myself, like you're going to pay me back in the future. I'm only giving because you ask, because you need it, because I want you to uh, look at me as your Dharma friend. I want to become your Kalyana Mitra, your uh, and also to help you out. And he thinks, he thinks, look, there's 10 kinds of delighting here in the, the basic practice that all Buddhas practice. Remember last week we said this is the Paramitas? This is the first of the Paramitas because they match up with the, the 10 stages. The first stage, the first paramita, the first practice of the 10 practices, all talk about generosity, real giving, not just, you know, sandwiches for the homeless. That's good. Uh, you talked about giving bread away. That's good. That's not, this is illustrating how a bodhisattva is unattached, is free of connection, craving longing for things, mm -mm, completely free of it. He gives so that the past practices of all Buddhas, Iche Jufo Bunso Shushing, can come alive in him, and he will be, she will be on the path of the Buddhas. No doubt, there are steps, putting, stepping in the footsteps, the footprints of the Buddhas of the past. 
he imitates them, remembers them, delights in them, purifies them of self, develops them, upholds them, reveals them, and teaches them. Okay. And I said it's not simple. Why is it not simple? Because the Bodhisattva actually does tag a, what they say, a rider. If, you, if you're an entertainer and you're signing a contract with a club and you need a rider in my dressing room, I want 15 bottles of Avion Kwang Trenshai, Avion Spring Water, and some ripe pears and Wi-Fi. That's your rider on your contract. You demand that. So then you, you're happy, you know, and you perform. So there's a rider on the Bodhisattva's contract that he is asking these beings to sign. He's making a deal. You want to eat my body? You can. However, however, what does he say? All the roots of goodness that I have planted, am now planting, and will plant, meaning all the goodness that comes from my generosity will bring me to get a huge body so I can fill anybody who wants fill the, the hunger, satisfy the hunger of anybody who wants it. If there's even a little one who hasn't eaten his fill, they, I won't die until they're full, right? I'm gonna, if they wanna be cannibals, I'm gonna be the, the human they eat. And with these roots of goodness, I will get the Buddha's enlightenment and realize Maha Nirvana. Furthermore, my contract, the writer, my contract reads, all beings who eat my body will also attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. They will get King Dong Da Hui, impartial wisdom. They will bring to perfection and then do all the Buddhist deeds up to attaining the nirvana that arhats get, nirvana without remainder. Uh, this is Pracheka Buddha's um, nirvana, is it? Or is that the Bodhisattva's nirvana? And even if there's a single living being who hasn't accomplished my contract, hasn't fulfilled my contract, I'm going to wait for them to eat their fill and then become Buddhas. After that, I'm done. Bodhisattva benefits beings this way, doesn't see himself, has no concept of beings, existence, a life, pudgala, that's complex divisions of self from the Abhidharma, no concept of person, mana, vaka, another Abhidharma category of self, no concept of doer or receiver, he only looks at the Dharma realm, the realm of beings, the realm of boundlessness, emptiness, non-existence, marklessness, no substance, no location, non-reliance, non-doing. What kind of giving does a bodhisattva do? When the bodhisattva contemplates like this, the self is gone. There's nothing given. There's no receiver. What is that? San Lun, Ti Kong, the three wheels, the three vehicles are empty, pure giving. There's no field of blessings. There's no karma. No retribution, no fruition. He doesn't see a great fruition. He doesn't see a small fruition. Then, I think this is fascinating. This is still the Avatamsaka, right? This is another chapter, but it illustrates what we heard today about inner wealth that our Bodhisattva on the first stage is completely willing to give up. What does he say? Actually, I didn't read this part in the Chinese. So I'm going to come right back here. Poor translators who are trying to create the Avatamsaka Sutra out of empty space. Okay, here we go. What does the Sutra say? It says, 做事关事,不见自身,不见事物,不见受者,不见福天。不见福天,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,不见寶,
，与生死内，受无数身，唯脆不停，速归坏灭。若以坏灭，若今坏灭，若当坏灭，而不能以不见故身，求见故身。我等尽学诸佛所学，正一切智，知一切法，为诸众生说三世平等。随顺其境，不坏法性，令其永得安稳快乐。佛子是名菩萨摩萨，欢喜恒。第一欢喜恒。So take a look. Conclusion here.、Uh, the Bodhisattva contemplates how all the bodies received by living beings of the past, present, and future soon perish, and he reflects, how remarkable that living beings are so foolish and ignorant. Amid birth and death, we receive countless weak and fragile bodies that quickly decay and perish. They may have already perished, are now perishing or about to perish, and yet nobody is able to use their unstable body to seek a stable body. I should study all that the Buddhas have studied, attain to all wisdom, omniscience, and understand all dharmas. I should proclaim the equality of the three periods of time for all beings in accord with the tranquility of the indestructible Dharma nature. I should help them find eternal peace and happiness. Disciples of the Buddha, this is the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's first practice of happiness. Okay, so you follow? Everybody still with me here? Or have you tuned out as soon as you heard about giving pieces of your body to others to eat? Ah. <laughs> The monk is talking about cannibalism. This is the worst horror movie I've ever attended for a sutra lecture. What does the Bodhisattva say? He says, "Take a good look at our bodies." He says, "What do our bodies do? They're always breaking down. They're always dying on us." How remarkable! He says, "Living beings are so foolish and ignorant. Right here in the middle of birth and death, we pretend like it's not going to happen." We get these countless weak and fragile bodies that quickly decay and perish, and they either have died or now in the process of dying or will in the future. And yet, nobody thinks to use this crummy body to get one that that lasts, meaning the indestructible Buddha Dharma body. So I should learn what Buddhas know, realize omniscience, understand the Dharma, and then teach. All living beings, how past, present, and future dharma is the same. Accord with the tranquility of the indestructible dharma nature, so that they and I, eventually, can find eternal peace and happiness. That is the bodhisattva's first practice. Isn't that <laughs> something? As First time I read that, I had to read it like three times to make sure I hadn't missed something. Because here's the sutra, this holy scripture. People think of scriptures as something you, you know, wrap up in a beautiful cloth and put them on the shelf, take them out on a Sunday morning. Here's the Avatamsaka Sutra saying the Bodhisattva is encouraging people to come and eat his body, so that they will become Buddhas quicker through their connection to him. He will cross them over, then. He will go to. This is real giving, but it's not blind giving. It's not giving for a fun, for a whim, fetishizing or cult-like. It's not. The Bodhisattva is using his or her wisdom to see through the truth of this thing, this object called a body that is so hard to maintain. Three times a day, we have to eat. Little bit of temperature variation. We pile on the clothes or take the clothes off. We have to wash it every day, or it smells. We have to brush its teeth all the time, and yet, even so, in the midst of that, it goes so fast. Bodhisattva says, "Relatively speaking, the Buddha Dharma is a better deal. I would rather get the Dharma than cling to this thing and think this is somehow I'm going to buy." Coloring its hair by giving it powder and lipstick, by feeding it lots of protein, I'm going to somehow postpone or avoid the inevitable. Go for the Dharma; it lasts 
longer. Better deal. So my priorities are there. Okay, so far so good, people follow. This is called This is called Shiming Pusa Zhu Yu Chu Di Da Shu Chang Jiu. This is called accomplishing great renunciation by a bodhisattva who abides on the first stage. Okay, ah, so that was that. I had to uh, come back and cover the same ground as last week so we could get clear on this. So, mom, no, I don't plan to light my body on fire. Not because it's the wrong thing to do, but because I'm not there, I would uh, be unhappy and lose my resolve. If I had real control of my birth and death, which is the goal of the prince, Siddhartha, founder of our faith, maybe I could. Not there yet. Time for a musical break. Kind of clean, let the, those thoughts settle, right? Moving forward, we got more to go here. For the Pusa eats Tsubei Da Shushin, Wei Yu Jiu Hu Yiche Zhong Sheng, Chuan Gong Tui Chiu Shi Chu Shi Jian, Chu Li Yi Shi, Wei Wu Pi Yan Gu, Chi De Cheng Jiu, Wu Pi Yan Xin. Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva, using his compassionate mind of great renunciation, wishing to rescue and protect all living beings, further enlarges the scope of his search for all worldly and world transcending beneficial matters. Never being tired or weary, therefore, he then realizes an untiring, unwearied mind. So what happens here, uh, this is fascinating, and we're going to do a, a little bit of a, a chunk here, a little bit of, we're going to cover some ground because why there's a series of um, relationships between things that happen to our bodhisattva. We have come to the end 
of the first stage, essentially, before we get to what's called the boilerplate, the refrain that happens over and over again in every one of the stages, the Bodhisattva is uh, now going to, uh, in every, every one of the 10 stages, you, there's uh, the, the preface, there's preparation, there's the first steps, there's the, the heart of it, the things that the Bodhisattva is learning that's new and fresh in the, each new stage. Then there's kind of a uh, results of that. And then there's the, the, the refrain part and we get to the verses and it re there's the summary verses. So now we're at the results part. And this is fascinating because of the, it's a, uh, if this, then that, and with this, then that section, which I'll just, uh, instead of, but now that I prepared you for it, um, I just wanna, I'll, I'll go over it and let it speak for itself, okay? Here we go. De wu pi yan xin yi, yu yi che jing lun, jing lun, xin wu chue ruo, wu chue ruo gu qi de cheng jiu, yi che jing lun zhi. Huo shi zhi yi shan neng chou liang, ying zuo bu ying zuo, yu shang zhong xia yi che zhong sheng, sui ying sui li. Sikupusa 成坚固力,得坚固力以亲公诸佛,与佛教法能如说行,能如说行. Ah, okay, here it is. Listen for the relationship here. Because of this, then that, ready? So I'll uh, give one sentence back. It says, uh, further enlarges the scope of his search for all worldly and world transcending beneficial matters, never being tired or weary. Therefore, he then realizes an untiring, unwearied mind. Once he has a tired and untiring, unwearied mind, his mind is no longer timid about sutras and shastras. Because he is no longer timid, he accomplishes the wisdom of all sutras and shastras. Once he's acquired that wisdom, he is skilled at estimating what should be done and what should not be done. He acts in a way that is appropriate and timely towards all superior, average, and inferior living beings. And he does so in a manner that they like. Thereupon, this bodhisattva accomplishes worldly wisdom. Once he has accomplished worldly wisdom, he knows living beings' seasons, he knows their capacities, Equipped with the adornments of repentance and reform, he diligently cultivates benefiting self while benefiting others. He therefore accomplishes the adornments of repentance and reform. In the midst of those practices, he diligently cultivates transcendence without retreating or deflecting and accomplishes the power of stability. Once he's acquired the power of stability, he diligently makes offerings to the Buddhas. He is thus able to speak and to practice the Dharma as the Buddhas taught it. All right. So did you see the, once this happens, then this happens. And because that happens, then therefore. So there's steps. There's steps along the, uh, the, the learning curve. There's progress along the path. The, What's so nice about this is it's super clear and it's presented very much like um, a school curriculum. Anybody who read Harry Potter, you know, you can see the first years at Hogwarts and you know, all their, 
different houses? You know, are they Gryffindor? Are they Slytherin? And they prepare, they study for the exams. And of course, Hermione always comes out first. And, you know, so similarly, our Bodhisattva uh, is going through this course of study and accomplishes this. And that allows the next step to happen. Takes every step along the way. Um, just have no doubt that this is a handbook for training bodhisattvas. And you can see, what does the bodhisattva get? Gets an untiring, unwearied mind. So as a result, can dive into sutras, dive into shastras. They don't scare him. They don't seem too, too thick, too dense, too philosophical. Why? Because he sees them as they are, which is the Buddha's paper trail for what he discovered as he bought living being. Bodhisattva needs these now to, be, to become a better teacher of living beings, right? So anybody who's good at muting microphones might want to mute those microphones there. So whoever that is there, thank you, yeah. So notice that the Bodhisattva, uh, well, I think it's, it's great. He learns from the sutras and that wisdom teaches him what to do, what not to do. And uh, he's, so no matter who he's talking to, uh, I, di I didn't mean for you to mute your mic. <laughs> whoever was talking. So whoever he's talking to knows exactly what to say. And he can say it in a way that, that they like. And worldly wisdom comes about. Worldly wisdom, however, without losing his or her uh, samadhi or deportment, never crass, never uh, provincial, never um, crude. Bodhisattva always knows what to say, so it hits the heart. Once that worldly wisdom is in place, he looks at living beings and he knows exactly what to say, no matter who he's talking to. And look at this is what I think is fascinating. At this point, he doesn't become a dictator. He doesn't go run for, for Congress. Instead, he learns to repent. Repentance and reform. And he can help others out while he's helping himself. Humility is the result of that worldly knowledge. And he, trans he cultivates transcendence, leaving the world, but he doesn't retreat. And so he becomes stable. Now that's key, okay? The Bodhisattva knows how to enter samadhi through meditation and just zone out, and he doesn't. She keeps her connection to every amount of pain that living beings experience. And just like a doctor who knows that by, you know, sticking the needle in somebody's arm, they're going to go, ooh. And yet the result of that is they're going to be, their lives will be saved. And so he's, yes, okay, here. He snaps his finger, gives the kid a little bit of, you know, candy. And oh, before they know it, it's over. Skillful. Skillful. Uh, is able to stay with the pain to help others out. And now this is a key, this is really important here. The Bodhisattva gets stability, so what? So he can make offerings to the Buddha. Once again, this thing about making offerings to the Buddha is emphasized. I had no idea that this was something important or valuable. I didn't know. It's like making offerings to the Buddha comes up over and over again for Bodhisattvas. It's worth looking into. Huh? And finally, he hears the Dharma the way the Buddha taught it, and he can actually practice the way the Buddha taught it, not how he thinks about it. So in certain Buddhist circles in America, there is this notion that somehow the Sangha is irrelevant and unimportant and anachronistic. 
You heard that one? The Sangha, you know, monastics aren't important anymore because, well, we all know the Dharma. We can all meditate and practice Vipassana mindfulness. So we don't really need the Sangha. A lot of people who have never actually met the Sangha don't know what it's all about, but it looks just too, um, what, inconvenient for them, too stuffy. There are things they don't do, so they can't be fun. No drinking, no sexual misconduct, no stealing, no lying, no killing. What's the fun in that life? So, you know, for various knee-jerk reasons, people feel that somehow uh, monks and nuns are nothing to, to imitate, not to be moved by them or impressed by them, not to follow them. Really. So how sad. That's not the way the Buddha taught it. Okay, how about that? Alrighty, um, I wanted to uh, take a little bit of time here and talk about uh, someone who's passed away. Um, you notice that we are reading the acknowledgement to country here in Australia. And we will do the same in North America when we're lecturing from that soil. And uh, this week, we acknowledge the passing of Joanne Shenandoah, a friend, Native American, Iroquois, member of the Wolf Clan, daughter of the clan mother, Maisie Shenandoah, and uh, granddaughter of Chief Shenandoah. And people uh, really noticed Joanne's passing. Uh, she passed away at age 64 in the Mayo Clinic uh, last week with liver complications of liver disease. And her biography and her obituary appeared in, on NPR and in New York Times, and people are talking about it. And I wanted to share a story that, uh, that I uh, have about Joanne. Um, here she is at the Berkeley Monastery. We invited Joanne to uh, uh, do house concerts at the Berkeley Monastery. She and her daughter, Leah, came twice. Uh, Sister Diane came once. Um, here they are singing on the, at the altar, the Berkeley Monastery. You can see this is the older uh, altar is different these days. Some of the Buddhas hadn't arrived. There's uh, Leah was already taller than her mom at that point. Um, here she is with <laughs> Christina and Amanda Wynn, who are stage struck, starstruck. This is Diane, this is Diane, her sister, and Leah, her daughter. Christina and Amanda. This is. 2000, when was this photo taken? This was taken, uh, let's see here. I don't have the original date. I've only got the, yeah. Early, I think maybe 2001, uh, something like, no, that wouldn't have been. Yeah, so don't know when. Um, one more photo. Here is, uh, the late Houston Smith, who knew Joanne years and years and years ago back in Syracuse. And this is the late Reverend Bill Lesher, the chairman of the Parliament of World's Religions, all meeting at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And the, uh, the story that I wanted to tell has to do with giving of fearlessness, giving of courage, something that I witnessed and I, I've told it before, but I, I wrote this down at one point for the United Religions. And I, I'll, uh, I think I'll read it as I wrote it because there's uh, lots of details here. I was standing at the San Francisco airport next to Houston Smith, Professor Smith. We were heading to Cape Town, South Africa, 
for the Parliament of World's Religions. And the news came out. I didn't know this until we all showed up at the uh, airline's counter. Professor Smith had invited representatives from North America's native spiritual traditions to go to Cape Town for the Parliament. He said, we Northern Europeans are head heavy people. We tend to get our theology stuck above the neck, he said. The Native American spirituality is grounded in nature and it reminds us not to miss the divinity in the world around us. We have so much to learn, said Professor Smith. And uh, so we agreed. There was uh, a lot was hanging uh, and much at stake hanging on the gathering. It was December, 1999. It was Y2K. I don't know if people remember the turn of the millennium, Y2K. Uh, they were predicting disruptions of travel communications. A terrorist bomb had exploded in Cape Town at a restaurant uh, about a week before we, we left. And uh, the other members of the delegation from DRBA stayed back. Uh, I went with John Ju uh, to go to the two of us. Uh, so other people said, you know, precisely because there's bombs going off, we have to go to the parliament to show them religions don't fight. So it was the first time in South Africa that they'd hosted the world's religions in this extraordinary gathering. Also the first time that Native American spirituality, many indigenous traditions were going to be acknowledged and invited to join the world's religions. The news got to Cape Town that 50 Native Americans, North America's first people were coming and the parliament's African staff, very hard to impress, they were thrilled because real Indians were gonna be coming. They'd only seen them on Hollywood films before. So after that long flight, uh, we gathered with 7,000 souls, 40 religions, traditions, spiritual paths in the Cape Technicon University Auditorium to open the first evening, the plenary, first time we're gonna to meet together uh, the MC invited an elder from the Pueblo tribe, Herman Agoyo, to sing a native benediction. He brought his wife out and his daughter and they had a rattle and chuk, 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 chuk. he says to the audience, now representing native peoples of North America, I give you our most distinguished musical artist, Joanne Shenandoah. And Joanne took the stage wearing tan buckskins. She stood in the spotlight uh, with a black guitar reflecting the light to us all down below. And she said, we are now reminded to be aware of our place upon this earth and to fulfill our obligations to ourselves, our families, nations, the natural world, and to the creator. The words say, we are to awaken, stand up, be counted, for you are being recognized in the spirit world, said Native American musician and visionary Joanne Shenandoah. She spoke first in English and then sang in Oneida, Iroquois to a deepening stillness in the hall. Her expression radiated an awareness of the significance of standing as a Native American woman on the center stage of the world's religions. She was solemn with that responsibility, but she was light with inspiration. Joanne's voice was musical and gentle, but powerful with a quality of graceful strength that I hadn't heard before. I let my ears settle and I heard a song rooted in the North woods. There was snow falling, her feathers, white and green boughs, pine smoke. Her voice was dignified and primal the winter coat of both the deer and the wolf. And I looked up and I saw that the power of that moment had brought tears to her eyes. One tear tracked down her cheek and it shone in the spotlight. Her voice caught, but then because she's a savvy, experienced performer, she smiled. She closed her eyes and sang right through the emotion. Seeing the world's religions honor the wisdom of ancient peoples, I felt an unexpected joy and a heart-filling pride it was not even mine to own, but I felt it. I had an impulse to tap the arm of the person next to me and say, you see what America has? That, that's my country too. <laughs> Wherever she's from, I'm from there. So there were five days in Cape Town and my heart was stretched and my assumptions were challenged by encounters with hundreds of religious and cultural spokespeople, including Nelson Mandela and a certain Tibetan Lama. Uh, when I returned home to Berkeley, 
the first thing I did was find Joanne's email and I introduced myself. Then I called Houston Smith and I thanked him for expanding my awareness of the richness of native traditions. I shared my epiphany from Cape Town. Uh, I listened to her voice again. I understood more of the vision that had inspired me there in Cape Town. She, her mission was as a composer, according to seers in the tribe, is to bring the real, the worldview of the Iroquois Confederacy back to life again. Uh, her name meant she sings in Iroquois language. Thinking back to the experience at the Parliament of Religions, I sensed that I was not the only one to be surprised and carried by the power of Joanne's music and his message. She carried the gathered religions to a place of unity, not only among humanities religious institutions, she brought us, brought us to an expansive religious heart that included the rivers, the forest, the eagle, and perhaps for warring humanity, the woman. At the Parliament of World's Religions, Native, Native American earth-based spirituality met the theologies of Europe and the meditative traditions of the East on equal ground. Then it took us a step up to higher ground, a sacred space that celebrates the earth and the feminine. This is a redefinition of the role of religion rooted deeply in the soil of North America. When Joanne sings, you hear the female human, the strong yin, balanced in a healing, nurturing relationship between earth and sky. At the invitation of Hillary Clinton and Tipper Gore, Joanne wrote a song to honor women. She presented a song at the gathering of native chiefs in the White House in 1996. In peace and war, she will embrace, see strength and wisdom in her face. She'll offer her hand, though tired and worn, and nurture the land for those unborn. Turns out that the Iroquois governing structure was matriarchal. I didn't know that. She has an album called Matriarch, which contains musical gifts for the women in her family. She wrote a medicine song for each of her female relatives, a gift from nature sounding through her, a healing song to accompany the life road of each of her female kin, daughter, mother, grandmother, sisters, nieces. The melodies come through her from the elements. It's a gift of spirit from the air, fire, water, and earth. Several of the tunes are stomp dances to be danced by women in a circle, turning around the fire in the longhouse. Political decisions in the Oneida tribe traditionally were carried forward by clan mothers who determined when and where wars would be fought, when the wars would stop, and who would fight. <laughs> Don't you wish, you know. Uh, uh, Jill Biden would say, stop fighting, come home. Her work, Eagle Cries, opens with a tribute to her mother, Maisie Shenandoah, who the late Maisie Shenandoah, who is current clan mother of the Wolf Clan, includes the voices of daughter Leah and sister Diane. Her songs will soothe your soul to sleep, and the stories she'll tell, you'll always keep. She'll quench your thirst, dry tears from your eyes, give food for your spirit, and bring us new life. She'll heal you inside, her prayers carry high. We give thanks to the woman, friend, mother, lover, and guide. The Iroquois tradition values music that sings from a good mind, a mind that is clear, content, and beautifully calm, never stretching or going to edges. Joanne's voice expresses that message as much as her words, balanced and serene, seeking the middle and unbroken. She sings in the Iroquois language of the creation of the Iroquois Confederacy, a story sacred to the tribe called Peacemaker's Journey. It tells the names of men and women who brought an end to hostility. The names include Skenanahauri, the peacemaker of legend, his first disciple, Ayanwata, and Jikonsase, the mother of nations, a woman who, like the clan mother in the current Iroquois community, made decisions for the tribe and helped create the League of the Iroquois, the first United Nations on Western soil. Their written constitution gave birth to a vision whose principles informed Thomas Jefferson as he organized the Constitution of the United States. The dreamers predict that Joanne's music and the ancient way of life her songs celebrate will tell the world of the wisdom of the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. The Longhouse and its peoples, Joanne's ancestors, sheltered a peaceful confederacy of six tribes that had formerly been blood 
enemies. Inside the longhouse, many fires could be built. Many tribes could live together in peace. They buried their weapons beneath a tall pine, a tree of peace watched over by an eagle. Okay, to conclude my article here, one more paragraph and we're done. Joanne presents a spirituality that embodies a humanity in balance between earth and sky. This vision strives for peaceful balance, coexistence, and a fundamental harmony with the natural world and with the feminine. This is femininity in its aspect of sacred wisdom, Sophia, Prajna Paramita, the perfection of insight. Joanne's voice is an instrument that teaches as it sings the voice of the Tao at its receptive, nurturing female source, a power that like the earth does not cut, but sees, supports, soothes, and sings. Sadly, the loss of Joanne Shenandoah too early, and her husband Doug, George, Canantio, and Leah, and her grandson uh, will be uh, carrying on. So, all right, uh, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei, sure. Would you like to? You're in the middle of your Guanyin session. You want to report what is happening? Oh, your Earth, your sure. Earth. Amitabha. Amitabha session, right. So we just finished our first day of the Amitabha session here at BBM. We transmitted the eight precepts this morning and uh, had a day of practice. And we'll begin tomorrow again at 8.30 a.m.
You see all the information there on the website. If people haven't put up your memorial plaques yet, um, you can still do so. Um, actually, quite a few people in our community have loved one who's passed away. So it's uh, definitely in people's hearts in terms of dedicating merit for their well-being. Um, how many how many pieways were signed up? Um, I mean, if I were to guess, I think I would say probably six or seven hundred, maybe. Okay. Wow. Did you have a count on uh, folks who registered or who are who who were watching first day? Um, I don't have a count. I, when I glanced at the eight precepts, it looked like there was something maybe like a hundred. A little bit over a hundred, it seemed like. Maybe for eight precepts. We yeah, were both on YouTube and Zoom. Right. Um, but yeah, if people want to join in, oh, we start out tomorrow, uh, same time, 8.30 a.m. And then same thing for the afternoon, 12 p.m. And then 2 to 3.30 p.m. So um, please join in. The link is the same. You can find us at this channel, Dharma Realm Live, or you can register for our Zoom link. That's our regular BBM online zoom link so yeah that's the main things happening also this friday will be the last lecture by dr verhoven on the avatamsaka sutra mm -hmm. for and, for the for the season then he'll be back yeah, for the for the semester for the semester and he'll be coming starting again in the spring semester um and i'm not sure about the other teachers but i think, I think they're gonna be winding down for the for the winter break um, and the other thing I can see on the website here is the Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Merit, which we'll do at the end of the end of the um, uh, it's a, a month. Yeah. Okay. Are, do yeah. you have a cold? No, I'm okay. That's good. Okay. All right. Excellent. So please do take advantage of the online Amitabha session, a chance to recite the Buddha's name and with all the bells and whistles, all the fixings. And also you can download the text that we use, the uh, bilingual sutra, the transferences that we use uh, for various parts of the session. So it's uh, a uh, Buddhist, uh, a fa hui, a Dharma assembly in the Mahayana tradition is quite, a, quite an event. Uh, there's lots of, uh, lots of moving parts and uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, integrated and wonderful way to practice the Dharma. Focused on Amitabha's vows, the Buddha of limitless light and limitless life. All righty. So moving on. Next week, we will come to the end. Uh, no, sorry. Premature. We have... Uh, the, ref the what's called the boilerplate, the refrain parts of the first stage to share with everybody. Look forward to your joining us next week. Uh, last thing we do every week is transfer the merit and we've been transferring it according to Medicine Buddha, Medicine Buddha's mantra. Um, we get two for one by doing it this way. It is a vehicle for transferring, but it also sends out the vibration of healing uh, as from an expert, Medicine Buddha, the Buddha who dispels calamities and lengthens life, the Buddha of lapis lazuli radiance. Sounds good. Let's chant together. Send out the goodness. And uh, I'll be transferring merit to, among other people, to Joanne Shenandoah for her rebirth in Amitabha's Pure Land.
some Buddha images from City of 10,000 Buddhas. I'd like you to join me bowing to them. Here's an image of Master Hua. We can make three bows to our teacher. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. That's it for us for today. Thank you all for joining everyone. See you all next week. Om Tofu.